हेलो गाइस हाउ आर यू आई एम हरदीप सिंह वेलकम बैक टू योर ओन यूट्यूब चैनल आल्स अपडेट्स एंड रीसेंट एग्जाम्स फॉर मोर अपडेट्स रिलेटेड टू रीसेंट आल्स एग्जाम राइटिंग दस टॉपिक्स लिस्टनिंग रीडिंग प्रैक्टिस टेस्ट एंड स्पीकिंग क्यू कैट गेस वर्क प्लीज गाइस पार्टिसिपेट इन एवरी डे लिस्टनिंग एंड रीडिंग प्रैक्टिस टेस्ट टू अचीव योर डिजायर बैंड स्कोर इन योर एक्चुअल आल्स एग्जाम Please hit the like and subscribe button. Press the bell icon for the upcoming notifications. Don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page Alts updates and recent exams. Part 1. You will hear a telephone conversation between a customer and a shop assistant. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. Good morning, Jenny Suit Rental. Jenny speaking. How may I be of service? Hi there. My name is Max Jones. That's J O N E S, and I'm looking to rent a suit out for a special occasion. Certainly, Max. We charge a set fee for our services. You can either choose from our designer range and pay fifty pounds to rent your suit out, or choose from our standard range at a cost of twenty-five pounds. So, what will it be? Oh, the first option, please, Jenny. Twenty-five uh, pound, did you say? Unfortunately, not. The designer range is twice that price. Oh, in that case, I'll take the second option. Uh, standard was that it? That's right. Now, before we go any further, may I ask how you intend to pay? Do you accept checks? Yes, but only in exceptional circumstances. We prefer cash or credit card. Well, as I haven't got one, does this count as uh, those circumstances? Yes, that'll be fine. Make it payable to Jenny's Suit Rental. Will do. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions four to ten. Now, Max, can I take your measurements, please, and a few details about what sort of suit you have in mind? Certainly. Let's start with the trousers, then, shall we? What is your waist size and leg length? I used to be thirty-two waist, you know, but these days it's more like thirty-six. Too many cream pies. I've been there. And about the leg, thirty-four. I wish. I'm afraid I'm somewhat lacking in the height department. Not even a thirty-two. Thirty, I'm afraid. Never mind. As for the colour, could you do a dark grey suit? In fact, we have a very smart one of those in just your size. You're in luck. Now, what about shoes? Same colour? No, I think I prefer something darker. Okay, let's go with traditional black then, shall we? What about size? Uh, I'm a size forty-five. Hmm. By my calculations, that's a、uh, ten in our sizes. And style? What have you got? We do suede, nubuck, and traditional leather. Definitely the last one. Very well. And will you be wanting a necktie? Do you do bow ties? Of course. I'll put one of those down in your order. Dark grey, I presume. Perfect. To match the suit. I think I fancy a light blue shirt. By the way. Might I recommend a green? Green would go very well with the suit you are renting. Light or dark? I'd say dark. Dark it is then. My next size is seventeen and a half.、Uh, hard to believe that a little over a year ago I could fit into a fifteen, isn't it? Those cream pies again, right? You got it. Now, what about your suit jacket? Same colour as the trousers, obviously, but what size? Medium should be fine. You sure? Yeah. And have you got any of those three button ones? I'm afraid not. The one and two button suit jackets are far more popular at the moment. In fact, the one button is all the rage. Let's have that one then. 
No problem. Now. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You will hear part of an interview between Dr. Hilsden, a member of staff on a fashion design course, and a student, Julia, who is applying to do the course. First, look at questions 11 to 13. Right, Julia. So, from your CV and portfolio, and what you've already told me, you seem to be very much the sort of person we're looking for on the postgraduate course. So tell me, you finished your fashion design course in London four years ago. Did you think of carrying straight on and doing a higher degree at the time? Yes, but there were financial pressures. So I ended up working in the retail industry, as you can see from my CV. Mm -hmm. And actually, it was a very useful experience. Hmm. In what way? Well, I was lucky to get the job with Fashion Now. They're a big store. And one of my priorities was to get as much experience as possible in different areas. So that was good, because I had the chance to work in lots of different departments. And having direct contact with the customers meant I was able to see how they reacted to innovation, uh, to new fashion ideas. Because with Fashion Now, a designer might show something in New York or Milan, and there'll be something similar in the shop within weeks. So that was probably the most useful thing for me. Right. And so what's made you decide to do a postgraduate course now? Um, well, while I enjoyed working at Fashion Now, and I learned a lot there, I felt, uh, well, the way forward would have been to develop my managerial skills, rather than my skills in fashion design, and I'm not sure that's what I want to do. Mm, yes. When I was doing my degree in London, I'd been interested in women's wear, but I know that there's been a lot of work done in areas like new fabric construction, and though I'm not intending to go too deeply into the technology, I'd be very interested in looking at how new fabrics could be used in children's wear. So I'd like the chance to pursue that line. Yes, good. And are you at all concerned about what it's going to be like coming back into an academic context after being away from it for several years? No, I'm looking forward to it. Huh. But I'm basically more interested in the application than the theory or at least that's what I've found so far. And I'm hoping the course will give me the contacts and skills I need eventually to set up my own enterprise. I'm particularly interested by the overseas links that the department has. Yes, many of our students look overseas or to international companies for sponsorship of their projects. Before the talk continues, look at questions 14 to 20. And the facilities here look excellent. I just went to look at the library. It's really impressive. There's so much room compared with the one at my old university. Yes, most students find it's a good place to study. Mm. And there are link-ups to other universities, of course, and all the usual electronic sources. The staff run an information skills programme, which we recommend all postgraduates do in the first week or two. 
Design students find these special collections particularly useful. Yes. Then we have a separate computer centre, which has its own academic coordinator, Tim Spender. He's got a background in art design, and the ethos of the centre is that it's a studio for innovation and creativity, rather than a computer laboratory. Oh, right. I liked the study spaces where students can sit and discuss work together. Very useful for joint projects. We always had to do that sort of thing in the cafeteria when I was an undergraduate. <laughs> And I read in the brochure that there's a separate resource for photography. Yes, it's called Photo Media. It's not just for photography, but things like digital imaging and new media. It's a resource for all our students, not just fashion design. And we encourage students to work there, producing work that crosses disciplinary boundaries. It's well used. In fact, it's doubled in size since it was set up three years ago. And we also have an offshoot from that, which is called time-based media. This is for students who want to develop their ideas in the area of the moving image or sound. That's in a new building that was specially built for it just last year. But there are plans to expand it, as the present facilities are overstretched already. Right. Now, uh, is there anything you'd like to ask about the course itself? Um... I know it's a combination of taught modules and a specialist project, mm -hmm. but how does assessment fit in? Well, uh, as you'd expect on a course of this nature, it's an ongoing process. The degree course has four stages, and there are what we call progress reviews at the end of each of the first three. Then the final assessment is based on your project. You have to produce a report which is a critical reflection on your work. And is there some sort of fashion show? There's an exhibition. The projects aren't all focused on clothes as such. Some are more experimental, so that seems more appropriate. We ask representatives of fashion companies along, and it's usually well attended. Right. And another thing I wanted to ask. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. You are going to hear Dr. Joanna Robinson, the course director of a language learning center, answering questions from reporters from the student newspaper. First, look at questions 21 to 26. Welcome to the Language Learning Center. I'm Joanne Robinson. You must be the reporters from the Examiner. Please come in and sit down. Hello, Dr. Robinson. Yes, we're from the Examiner. I'm Cheryl Perkins, and this is Don Klim. May I start with a question? Did this college really start with Brazilian students? It did. The Language Learning Center was founded in 1985 to look after a group of students from Brazil who wanted to study here. Those 20 students soon grew to 60, and as you can imagine, we had severe accommodation problems. Somebody said you were in the old amenities block, right near the engineering school. They have a good memory. Yes, we were there because the university hadn't believed we would expand so quickly. The problem wasn't solved until we moved into these new premises in Bancroft House in 1987. When did you start taking students from other countries? About 1990. We now have students from 13 different countries enrolled, and we expect a large group from Turkey next month. Yes, we've noticed a lot more advertisements for Turkish restaurants in our advertising section. Well, 40% of our students come from Turkey, by far the largest single national group, and I believe there's been an influx to the rest of the university. 
There are a lot of Turkish students studying hospitality. Do you offer anything special to the students? Yes, we do. There are several things which make us rather different from other language schools. English is certainly not restricted to English for academic purposes here. Sometimes we have extra classes for students who have particular courses in mind. And we have just said goodbye to a group of 30 Indonesian students who were preparing for a university course in agriculture. They came to us for English for farming, and they were with us for a long time. We miss them. How long do students usually stay at the language learning center? It varies, so I'll talk about the average. Most of our courses last for five weeks, but to make any real progress, a student needs to be here for at least three terms. That's 15 weeks. The students do better if they have a little time to settle in at the beginning of the course, and we offer an orientation course that lasts a week. Most students take it. It helps them to settle down, and it gives us plenty of time to test them and place them at the right level. How many people are in each class? We sometimes go up to 18, but our average class size is 14 students, and some classes have as few as seven participants. It depends on the needs of the group. You were saying that you miss your students when they go. How do you attract students? I mean, how do they hear about the Language Learning Center in the first place? We're included in the university advertising and marketing, and we have our own website. The thing which works best for us, though, is word of mouth. Students who leave us often send us their friends. In fact, a student who arrived today was carrying a photograph for me of a former student and his baby. It sounds like a nice place to be. It is. A lot of our students make lasting friendships while they're here. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Making friends with other students sounds special enough. I'd like to emphasize that in the student newspaper. We do try to get our students to be part of the wider university. How do you do that? Do you encourage them to join the sports center, for instance? Indeed we do. The sports center is always looking for active participants, particularly in soccer. Oh, and something else. You might like to mention that we don't teach just English here. I mean, we're a language center, not an English language center. You may learn Spanish, Mandarin, and Russian here, and we can sometimes offer other languages. This means we can have some students who are native speakers of those languages as conversation partners for English-speaking students. Who can do these courses? At this stage, any native speaker of English. What about the people who are learning English? Can they do a non-English language course? At this time, only if they've almost finished their English language course. You see, we try very hard to involve students who are native speakers of English as conversation leaders, and we encourage our students to join groups on the campus. For instance, if they enjoy music, there is an active jazz group available to everyone, and that's a lot of fun. On the other hand, elementary students can't go to the drama group. Their English just isn't ready for that sort of activity but the university choir welcomes all the singers it can find. They often do large productions that need a lot of voices. I imagine the special conversation groups are open to all your students. I wish they were. I'm sorry to say they're a special service we provide for elementary students only. Is there anything else I can tell you? I'd be really pleased if you could write about the courses we offer in foreign languages. I think our readers will be very interested in that. Thank you for your time, Dr. Robinson. Yes, thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about the center. It's always good to let the rest of the students at the university know what goes on in our classrooms and outside them. After all, many of our students leave us and then study for degrees in various disciplines on this campus. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. You are going to hear a conversation about using recorded delivery and registered post. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Tom, where are you going? To the post office. I'm going to send some packets to Leeds. Do you know the best way to send them? Well, if your need is for a record of posting and delivery rather than compensation for loss, recorded delivery is particularly suitable for sending documents and papers of little or no monetary value. Well, what can we send for recorded delivery? All kinds of inland postal packets, except parcels, airway, and railway letters and parcels. The service does not apply to mail for the Irish Republic. I see. How do I post them? You should get a certificate of posting form from the container in the post office and follow the instructions shown on the reverse. The certificate will be your record of posting. Can I send anything in the post? No, you can't. You must not send banknotes, currency notes and some valuable things because there is no special handling in the post. Recorded delivery mail is carried with the ordinary unregistered post and there is no special security treatment. How do we use recorded delivery? Well, when your letter or packet is delivered, it is signed for by the recipient and a record is kept by the post office. The post office does not undertake to deliver recorded delivery or any other mail to the addressee in person, but to the address shown. You can obtain confirmation of delivery by completing an advice of delivery form either at the time of posting or later. This form will be signed by a post office official, not by the addressee of the recipient. A fee is payable, which is lower if the form is handed in at the time of posting. Is there any compensation for loss? Well, compensation is limited. Compensation may be paid for loss or damage, but will not be paid for money or any other inadmissible item. If you want a speedy service for articles of value with extra security of handling en route and wish to have compensation in the event of loss or damage, you should use registered post. What can we send if we use registered post? Any first-class letter or packet, except airway letter or railway letter. How do we post? I mean, what should we do? Well, you should make sure that the packet is made up in a strong cover and then it is fastened with wax, gum or other adhesive substance. Hand the packet to the post office counter clerk, together with the cost of postage and the registration fee. Do not post it in the posting box. Make sure that the fee paid is adequate to cover the value of the content. The counter clerk will give you a certificate of posting, which he has initiated with the date stamped. Is there any special security for the registered post? Yes. All registered mail receives special security treatment. Packing is very important, because registration is not in itself a safeguard against damage. The contents of registered packets must be adequately packed. How do we pack them? Do we have to use special envelopes? Yes, you have to send the articles in one of the registered letter envelopes sold by the post office. These envelopes are already stamped for first-class postage and have the minimum registration fee. What about the compensation? Compensation will not be paid for the following articles such as banknotes, currency notes, trading stamps, coupons and some valuable things unless they are enclosed in one of the registered letter envelopes sold by the post office. I see. How does it deliver? The recipient on delivery signs for your registered mail. The post office does not undertake to deliver registered or any other mail to the addressee in person, but to the address shown. You can obtain confirmation of delivery by paying an additional fee and completing an advice of delivery form 
either at the time of posting or later. If you require the recipient's signature on the advice of delivery, the form must be handed in at the time of posting, otherwise a post office official will sign the certificate. The advice of delivery fee is lower if the form is handed in at the time of posting. Thank you very much for all this useful information. That is the end of part 4. So guys, don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page. I'll update some recent exams for more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing as topics, listening, reading, practice test and speaking you got guesswork. Please guys participate in everyday new IELTS listening and reading practice tests to achieve your desired band score in your actual IELTS exam. For more IELTS material, visit my official website www.ielsupdatesandrecentexams.com. The link is given below in the description. If you need PDF files of latest IELTS material, then please join my Telegram channel. So guys, please write your score below the comment section. Again, thanks for listening. God bless you all guys. Stay tuned. Stay safe.